How important is it for audiences to see themselves in the characters they see on screen? How important is it for audiences to see themselves? I, I think they should see themselves in whoever the protagonist is. But I think the thing that people confuse is that that, that uh, person should look like you. I, there are so many times I've seen movies where I identified with a character who wasn't my age, wasn't my gender, wasn't my ethnicity. And I think we live at a time now where people are so narcissistic, they look at movies like video games. Where in, whereas in a video game, you could actually design, for many games, design a character that looks like you, that looks almost exactly like you for certain video games. For movies, I think what people are talking about is uh, representation. I think I do believe that representation is something that is important. It's it's important to have, uh, you know, different types of people represented within a story where possible. But if you are only capable of identifying with a character who looks mostly like you, I would say that you're a narcissist, and I think that you you would benefit greatly from identifying with characters who don't look like you. And quite frankly, I tend to gravitate towards stories where, I mean, look, I spend all day with myself. I don't want a story about me. I'd like to see a story about a character that takes me to a different place, uh, that is experiencing different challenges in life that I may never have faced, so that I can ex safely experience that story through, through them. And it, they don't have to look like me. I think that there's been an, an overemphasis put on that, that there needs to be characters that look just like you. Well, what are we gonna do? Go through every single ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and remake all the stories with characters that fit every single checkbox? I think that just gets exhausting. I think it gets exhausting, and, and I, I really actually tend to gravitate towards stories, in particular world cinema. You know, I grew up watching uh, a lot of Asian cinema as a kid, and I loved it. It was an opportunity to explore another culture. You know, um, you, you're, you're gonna think this is crazy, but I saw a movie called Godzilla's Revenge when I was a kid, and I, uh, Godzilla's in the movie, and is a hero to a young boy, and he has these fantasies in his head about Godzilla and befriending Godzilla's son, Minya. And within that story with this little child, which is around the same age as me, but not the same ethnicity, he was Japanese. And, but it was interesting to see how he, he ate, you know, you know, these different experiences in the culture were very different. And I found that just really fun. I connected it with him because he was my same age. It really mattered very little to me that I looked like the, the kid in that movie. So I think you're missing a huge opportunity to experience the world differently through someone else's eyes. I, I think that's the whole, and I've said this before, it's the purpose of all fiction, comic books, movies, video games, novels, to see the world through the eyes of someone else. And, and movies give us an opportunity to do that. And if you're wholly obsessed with a character's gotta be like you, go play a video game, design a character that looks just like you, and go play that video game. But you're missing an opportunity, uh, certainly when it comes to, comes to movies. Is there a healthy aspect of narcissism in cinema? I mean, imagine you go through life never seeing yourself in a film or never seeing yourself in magazines, and then finally now, you're seeing people that look like you that have gone through the same thing. Yeah, now here, here's, here's a caveat to that. I would say that, you know, it's, I, I think it is important to have different types of people represented, but help me to identify with that person, with their plight, their story, their challenges, their struggles, you know? I think this, it, it, it's, it's a challenge I would lay out there to independent filmmakers, right? Have an audience identify with a character that where the majority of people will identify with someone who isn't them. Tell their story. I get involved in the story and the challenges for that character. I don't necessarily tend to focus so much on, on uh, you know, who the person is from their, you know, 
outward traits, right? I mean, one of my heroes growing up was the character Ripley from Alien. Uh, that one is brought up quite a bit. Sigourney Weaver is so great. I mean, even in even in the <laughs> even in the episodes or the 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 sequels in you know the Alien movies that are not that great, she's always great. Sigourney Weaver always seems to deliver. And you know, I saw that when I was a kid. Wasn't her age? Wasn't I? You know, uh, uh, I was n not a woman. Uh, <laughs> And you know, like I still identified with her mainly because I thought she was the smartest person. And the other thing people forget about the first Alien movie, I mean, there's a book about this, Save the Cat, right? She went back and saved Jonesy the Cat. And I think that that, that was one of the things that, and this happens late in the movie, right? So obviously she has a relationship with this cat, Jonesy, and I identified with that because you know what? I have a cat. You know, at the time I had a cat. I pretty much have always had cats. So, or, you know, it just, it, I, I think that that's uh, an easy way to identify. What is self insert? A self insert in a movie is when someone will literally take themselves and just make them the hero of the story. And I, I, I find that to be kind of off putting. We, we've seen it happen. Uh, it happens. It's happening now with more frequency where you see you you see a movie and you're like, okay, well, that's interesting who that person is. And then when you find out the backgrounds of the creators, it tends to just be almost exactly like them, down to even some physical attributes. And I'll say that many are guilty of this. If you look at the work of works of, say, David Cronenberg or even David Lynch, um, Kyle McLaughlin is pretty much a self-insert. <laughs> For, for David Lynch, kind of wide-eyed about the world. And if you compare their haircuts at the time, they pretty much had the same hair. Same thing with, um, uh, same, same thing with uh, David Cronenberg, right? I mean, when you know, he used uh, Jeremy Irons in, uh, was it, Dead Ringers, he, I mean, it looks like David Cronenberg, let's be honest, right? Um, so you see when filmmakers do this, Sometimes I think they do it subconsciously, uh, but you're seeing, I think, it more and more, and it can be used to good effect. And, um, you know, I mean, George Lucas named the lead character of his Star Wars saga Luke, kind of after himself. Luke, Lucas, you know, uh, that could be argued. So, self insert, I think, as long as you're aware, can work. I think when it's done almost to an exacting point, um, I, I don't know that it, that it succeeds every time. What if we just own our narcissism and say, okay, I like to see myself on screen like that? Well, I, I think the very act of thinking that someone would be interested in a story that you thought up in your brain is kind of narcissistic to begin with, to think, well, uh, I have this idea in my head, I'm gonna make a film, write a film, make a film, produce a film, direct a film, whatever part of the process you exist in, I'm gonna do that and then you're gonna give me money to see this story. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, look, you, you have to have sort of a healthy level of narcissism, but I think that needs to be balanced with self-awareness. I think it's absolutely critical that you have a profound self-awareness to be able to balance that narcissism and just keep it so it's it's not the thing that dominates. I mean. One thing I would, uh, if I could throw some couple tips out to some writers, one, keep a blazer in your car wherever you go. You never know where you're gonna be where throwing on a blazer, whether it's a casual one like I have now or whatever, you just throw it even over a t-shirt, um, it immediately sort of ups your game, right? Some level of upscale casual. The other thing is I never go anywhere without carrying notebooks, right? So. I always have a tiny notebook, very tiny that fits in the back of my pocket, and I'll carry this notebook around and I'll jot down ideas. And it's better than, yeah, I know we wanna use the notes function in your phone. No, this is better. There's something about sitting there with a pen and I always carry a pen. The space I, pen, right? The space pen is in my pocket currently. Oh, great, okay. But this goes in my back pocket and then 
The problem is, um, I believe leading a creative life where there are financial concerns, you have to balance two things. One is, you know, obviously being able to be creative. The second thing is being successful uh, from a business standpoint. And that's why you need a notebook that's a little thicker, probably like this. And I hate to tell you this, you're gonna spend your creative time probably like this and your business time in order to succeed in the film industry a little more like this notebook. This is like a, a, a moleskin and I think completely describes my sentiments for dealing with that aspect of the industry. And where does um, everybody's narcissism fit into that? So they've got their blazer, they've got the two books, the small one for creativity, the large one for business, but then we're all narcissist in one way or another. Where, where, do, where How do we balance that? Uh, you, you balance that with being humble so that you keep that narcissism in check, but be bold, right? And, and that comes with asking questions, it comes with uh, re relating to people and not by text and not by social media posts. I mean actually talking to people. And, I, and uh, especially when I meet young filmmakers today, they, uh, I just see that they haven't learned all the lessons and they're maybe out of balance. And the thing I see most often is just relating to people one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. So, you know, throw on a blazer or something upscale casual that you feel comfortable in, that represents you and how you feel about yourself and, and, and go out there and ask questions and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to say hello. Don't be afraid to say hi. Uh, don't be afraid to say hi if you run into me. I'll probably say hi back and, and we may get into conversations. Probably because, you know, if, if you meet me in person, you even know who the heck I am. Um, you know, we probably are into the same things. Uh, movies is a great place to connect with anybody uh, because who who doesn't like movies? Why why are you watch, why are you watching me? Why are you watching this channel? Yeah, I've had some great conversations with total strangers after movies, and it's it's great. I know I've said this before, but it's it's movies are a way to have a conversation about anything, anything in life. So be fearless about having those conversations and keep your narcissism in check. I, I'll say just like. When it comes to people I have met in the industry, people at the highest levels, I'm talking about major celebrities, superstars, are the most humble people I've ever met. And then it's generally the people that are sort of trying to claw their way to the top that, that you see are kind of having that, that, that struggle with their own ego. Why do you love movies so much? I feel like I love movies because it's like, it's like a waking dream, right? It's it's a it's a dream and an experience where you can, you know, enter the mind of a character and experience the world through their eyes, and it's it's actually safe, right? Whether that character, you know, um, gets horribly injured, has uh, terrible things happen to them, or loses, you know, loved ones, friends, family members. You're, you're able to experience those things, the kinds of things that everybody experiences in life in a way that's safe and in a way that imparts lessons, whether you're aware of it at the time or not. There's something in our lizard brain that responds to storytelling because I, I think it's, it's, it's a way for us to exercise our own demons or to deal with loss and pain from our past and that's why I think storytelling, and in particular movies, and in particular movies and seeing a movie in a theater when it's dark and you're focused and you're not on your phone, you're not distracted. Although I will say there is an entire category of movies that I would say this would be a good movie to watch while you're folding laundry. And I have watched those movies and I have folded laundry while I've watched them. But the <laughs> A, a film I know I'm really gonna care about, I'm gonna see in a theater, in the dark, experience the world through that character's eyes and, and come out the other end better for it. And it's so universal, that feeling, that feeling. That's why, you know, wherever you go in the world, um, people, people love to, you know, have a, have a story unfold on the big screen. I think there's something primal about that that goes back to telling stories around the campfire or just a fire, 
right? There's, there's something about it that's just embedded in our heads. And that's why, you know, um, the love and passion for film is so universal worldwide. When did you find that category of the uh, folding laundry film? I, I think the folding laundry film came during the pandemic in terms of watching stuff I probably would not have watched otherwise when it's just, well, we're here, there's no movies at the theater, I'm going to watch this thing. And so I think there is an entire category of movies and a lot of, uh, I would say, series television where you can get a lot of the story that is happening just from the it's just from hearing it so it's kind of an, an a radio play and they say that the original star trek series if you're not watching it if you're just listening to it and i can confirm this because when i was a kid i used to record the audio of old episodes of star trek and listen to them and even though i wasn't seeing everything when i would listen to those cassette tapes later I still got, got the story, you know? All of your narrative points, your, your, your character moments, you know, your drama from the music, uh, there, there's a whole world uh, of just like, just th that you can experience just from listening to it. And I, I, would, I would recommend just um, as an exercise for fun, some of the content on streaming services like Netflix, you can get not just the captions on, but there's a thing called audio description. And I strongly recommend that you do this. Try this out for fun. Take something you like if audio description is an option that's available. It's for people who are disabled, uh, may, may not be able to see. And not only do you hear the dialogue you hear a description of a narrator telling you what has is happening action-wise on the screen. It's, it's in a way almost like having the screenplay read to you. It's, it, it's I mean, it obviously as a function, uh, a useful function for people who are, are unable to see, but it also, as, as a way of learning, you know, you, you, can, you can listen to these, heck, you can listen to them while you're driving and you get the entire story, the audio descriptive version. Um, there's even, uh, you can look this up online, there's, there are people who list some of the best audio descriptive versions of content. So I, I, I find it really useful, I think it's interesting, but the folding laundry, yes, I think we've all had that experience where you're like, uh, this thing that I'm about to watch doesn't deserve all of my attention. For me, it's generally romantic comedies. I, Romantic comedies, as much as I am sometimes forced to watch them, I feel like that's, that's something I can multitask and, and still enjoy. Okay, so suppose tonight is laundry night. So after this interview, <laughs> I'm going to you know go down to the laundromat and then I'm going to come back and start folding and organizing. Right. Can you recommend two movies for me? Oh, sure. Uh, I, Marry Me with Jennifer Lopez, which I saw recently. That's a totally uh, a fold laundry movie. Okay. And uh, I would say Death on the Nile for recent films. Okay. They may not be recent when you're watching this. I have no idea when you're watching this. When are you watching this? I don't know. All right, great. I want to do laundry right now. I'm gonna <laughs> check them out. But we all know we have those, right? Everyone has, where you're just like, this is like my full attention is going on this Christopher Nolan movie or whatever it is we're seeing like I, you know, I'm gonna turn off the lights and I have my little, I have like this uh, sort of LED like blue light that goes around my oh, television. Kind of, kind of makes a movie theater experience in 4K, whatever. But then there's other things where you're like, nah, I'm just gonna have this on in the background. Or for me, it's even a movie I've seen so many times I can quote the entire film. Or what's great is when you think you're going to watch a film like that and you're actually surprised. Like I was watching old episodes. Do you remember VR5? No, I don't remember. Oh, VR5. okay. So it had Lori Singer, and it was about her. Um, she had this gift of being able to go into virtual reality, and mm -hmm. she was the only one that had this ability. Mm -hmm. And so she was being like wanted by big tech at that time, which was in the mid '90s. And it, the storytelling was excellent, you know. And it's got cool old graphics and modems. But I thought, oh, this is the perfect thing to put on. And actually, I couldn't do anything else. Right, right. Like some of those you put on, thinking like, ah, whatever. I'm gonna. 
you know, I'm going to I'm going to organize my receipts, right? Okay, that's something you're going to do. You put something on and then you do get caught up. I mean, that's that's a pleasant surprise, but but I, I kind of plan my viewing that way because I tend to watch at least a movie a day, if not more. It's just it's part of what I do. What does an American film mean today? I really think that there is no American cinema today. The last great era of American cinema was in the 70s and probably uh, the 80s as well. But um, I think that the American identity is so fractured because of current day politics that there's almost no such thing as a movie that everybody can get behind. I think the most recent example of one was the latest Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man No Way Home, which was a, an incredibly fun like Spider-Man, not just a Spider-Man movie, it's a Spider-Man movie that was built up over 20 years of Spider-Man movie fandom, starting with Tobey Maguire, um, Andrew Garfield, you know, and, and building up to this where now the, all the Spider-Men are, are united. That was like, hey, we can all get behind this. You know, it's a completely fun superhero movie ride. We can all get behind it. Is that an American film? I don't know, I would argue that the superhero genre is something that's very American made, but I, I really feel we've lost our identity as a country because it's so fractured into multiple different Americas. Uh, and I'll give you an example, this is a weird thing. I did a, I did a panel at a, a convention called Politicon and I pitched a panel called Trump the Movie. And I had a friend of mine who was a screenwriter, I had a friend of mine who worked in film development, and I asked, like, you know, almost every president post their presidency has a movie made about them, right? Not a documentary, a dramatic movie that, you know, sort of goes through the highlights, the lowlights, and, you know, and, and I wondered if, if a Trump movie would ever be made, how would you market that movie? And I got, it was a very interesting discussion because we got into this whole thing of like, okay, you make the movie whatever the movie is, what kind of movie would it be? Would it be more comedic? Would it be sort of farcical? You know, like maybe, maybe like from the mind of Adam McKay or something like that, you know, like, like what would it be one, but then here becomes the challenge of marketing that movie, which comes back to the question of American cinema. Okay, you've made a movie about the Trump presidency. Who is it for and how do you market it? Do you do a marketing campaign that is for uh, the red states that makes Trump look like a hero? Do you do another campaign, another marketing campaign from the same movie that talks about how he's a horrible human being? And this one, these are the trailers you would run in the blue states, I think it would be really interesting to see, which is why I think a movie like that will not be made. I don't think that there'll be a dramatic telling of his story of, of the Trump presidency. It's just not gonna happen, and I think it has to do with our fractured America. That's why we have no uh, really cohesive American cinema. Uh, I think that there are outside interests um, and the concerns of our corporate factory filmmaking are that this movie needs to play globally. So it, the, it's, again, and I've talked about this many times, the checkboxes that need to go, you know, in order for something to play to the world means that you've, you've kind of distilled it and, and it's not really a wholly American uh, American movie. And, and the only way you would notice this is if you watched a lot of Foreign, uh, foreign films, or or what they call now world cinema. So I would say to you, I, I say a, as an exercise for yourself, watch a Canadian movie. Watch a Canadian. It's very Canadian, and you know the a, a lot of countries actually subsidize their filmmakers and and the arts. Um, and in particular is the Canadian Film Board that you pitch a movie to the Canadian Film Board, has to have a certain percentage of Canadian talent in it, large percentage. It has to have Canadian themes and made for people in Canada. And there are a lot of things, you know, if you're watching this, you're American, you're not gonna get the jokes. 
I grew up uh, in Michigan, just, just outside of, of Canada. And, uh, and so I experienced the CBC. I watch Canadian children's programming. I watch Canadian movies. I watch Canadian hockey. I became a hockey fan from watching the CBC. But it's really interesting to see how distinct the American identity is to the Canadian, ca Canadian culture. So do yourself a favor and watch, see films from other countries and you'll notice how important it is for those countries to, to lay out their identity and their culture. In particular, French cinema does that as well. Um, so I'd say broaden your horizons, broaden your media diet, and you'll just notice that most of the movies that are made in America now are not for America, they're for the globe. They, they just are. And so I think what's happened is it's eroded our identity as Americans or something we could get behind. Because like I said, you're gonna make a movie about Trump, you're gonna have two marketing campaigns for that movie, no matter what that movie ends up being. Well, let's suppose we just take the name Trump out of it. We could use any president really in the last, let's say 20 years, we could use uh, any media figures in, right. in the last few years. If we were to have a trailer that was specific to their audience, wouldn't it be almost considered propaganda? Well, I would say that at least when it comes to, to documentaries, it's almost all propaganda now. I mean, I, I would say to documentary filmmakers, it's just like, I, I, and I see a lot of docs, small indie docs um, that come to Film Threat for us to look at. And it's almost all solidly on one side of the equation or the other. I've seen, you know, pro-Trump documentaries. I've seen anti-Trump documentaries. I would say that the only one that was truly unbiased was made by a British filmmaker called The Accidental President. Oh yes, I heard of that, yeah. I, and I strongly recommend The Accidental President. It's, um, it's just one because it's made by a Brit. It's just like, look, got no skin in the game. You know, let's let's look at Trump as a person and and what he did, and it was it's it's really fascinating because I think it's an it's an unbiased look at that at, at his run for the presidency, but really most political documentaries I see now they're either I I can already tell it's like oh, team red, team blue. Where where where, where what happened to being unbiased? What happened to being a journalist and seeking out truth no matter where it leads? You know, that used to be the way things were. Not sure what happened to that. Um, you know, and I, I've often said, Film Threat, my media outlet, filmthreat.com, where we review independent films, we're politically agnostic. We have people on all sides, um, you know, on, on all different uh, di diversities of thought, I think is my more, what takes priority with me. Um, and, I, and I do enjoy reading someone whose opinion doesn't completely line up with mine. It's an opportunity to, to learn something. But I, but I really see a fracture in, in the world of doc filmmaking where most of what's being produced is purely propaganda. You know, um, there was a, 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 a and, and, and to be clear, my politics are very middle of the road. You know? Sure. I, I, I can sit here and talk to you all day about Star Wars. And Star Wars is actually a good place. I'm sure we'll get to some Star Wars talk. Star Wars is a good place because it's a thing that most people have seen. 99.9% .9 of people have seen it. So it's a great entry point to talk about lots of issues. Um, that particular movie or, or film series and all that it begat. Um, but but boy, we, we've, we've really gotten to a place now where I just have concerns about We've lost the ability to objectively look at facts. And I think that's lazy. And here's why it, it bothers me. It's lazy because just as someone who's politically been in the middle, which means I generally despise both sides. You know, I think that let, let's come up with solutions to problems. And if you're focused on the solution, it really well, it shouldn't matter necessarily your, the politics or what you may be compromised by when it comes to your donors. But I, but um, now I feel that if you 
are on one side or the other, I feel that that, in my opinion, is kind of lazy because what, what it says is the thinking is done for you, which is why I think there are many ways to look at an issue. So um, I would just like to see documentary filmmaker filmmaking become um, less, less biased. I think, I think that would be a great service to all of us. Is writing weaker today than it used to be? I would say absolutely writing is weaker today. And, I, and, and I, I've looked at this and, and I think the disappointment I have about it is that one, we live in a time where media is so accessible. In two clicks you can see anything, including movies that just opened in theaters, right? Like whether it's available on a streaming service or whether there are other means, so much content, and I despise that word, but I'll use it. So much is available to us that what I fear is the current generation of writers are not influenced by life. They're not influenced by uh, great novels that they've read. They're not influenced by classic films. They're not influenced by travel, where they've traveled the world. They're not influenced by loves that they've had, great loves they've had or loves they've lost. They're not influenced by um, parenting experiences that they might have had or experiences with family or experiences, real world, real life experiences. My concern is that most movies being written today, movies and television are written by a generation that is influenced by other movies. So there's this snake eating its tail of writers influenced by other things they've seen rather than life experiences. When you look at the very first Star Wars movie, George Lucas, I know I bring it up a lot, but Star Wars was influenced by many things, you know, serials from the 1930s, um, from things like Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. I mean, George Lucas famously just wanted to make Flash Gordon but had trouble with getting the rights. It was influenced by Marvel Comics. It was influenced by a tragic event where he almost died um, in a car accident and was in the hospital for a long period of time. And that near-death experience changed George Lucas. Uh, much, much of his influence was from also his father in his life, who was a successful business person who he looked up to. Um, a lot of his experience was growing up in, in Modesto. People, uh, you know, the obsession over car culture and hot rods. And you see that in the character of Han Solo. You know, it's kind of a guy who's into hot rods. The Millennium Falcon is a hot rod. But so much of the influences that George had, both from life and so much uh, classic literature and storytelling, were kind of thrown in a blender. And now you've got every Star Wars movie is just influenced by the last Star Wars movie or the last Star Wars TV show or what they call this horrible term, member berries, which is we're gonna sort of throw out these member berries. Remember that? Remember that character? Remember this character? Remember that? And what it does is it takes, it completely takes the mystery. Half of the fun of some of these characters from the, Star, the world of Star Wars is the fact that we didn't know anything about them, that we could use our imagination. So what's happening is, the, what you're doing in is, is you've got this generation of writers that are weaker because they're just influenced by the previous work, right? And then secondarily, you're taking, you're, you're, you're dumbing down the audience and making them lazier because they're, they're not able to even make up something in their head about a character that was once mysterious and had two or three minutes of total screen time in a film series, Boba Fett. Now you've expanded on him to the point where, okay, we get it, we know everything about this character, right? Like, and, and I find that disconcerting. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think that there's something to be said um, from work that comes from older writers who have had some life experience. I can always spot, just because I've had kids and raised kids who are now off on their own and pay their own bills, which is awesome. But having been through that experience, I can always see how false a parenting relationship is when I see. Whether it's 
a, a filmmaker, writer, director who has never had children in their lives. And I see and there's like, oh, a dad would never do that. Or no way would a mother act that way towards a child. I just, I kind of see that. And I think it just, there's a falseness that just comes from my personal experience that now, does it completely ruin the movie? Not necessarily, not necessarily. But I think that writers would benefit from having the time to experience much of life first and then bringing that to their writing. Not in the way of like necessarily a self-insert, but at least being able to, what is it like to lose a loved one and happen, you know, have it happen right in front of you. You know what I mean? That, that kind of experience, um, if you've ever been in the room where someone close to you has passed away, um, a very difficult experience to go through and um, part of the therapy dealing with that is through creativity and writing. So I do think that our current generation of writers is, is weak because they haven't taken the time to have those experiences. Sure, there's the age thing. Do you think the internet plays a lot into that? Because it, let's say Gen Xers, we didn't have access to that and right. maybe baby boomers and, and beyond. There, we couldn't just easily go on Rotten Tomatoes or IMDb and look something up. Right. And in some ways that's wonderful, but in some ways maybe it's a disservice to creativity. So Yeah, I think access to too much information can uh, can hamper creativity, you know, when you're bombarded by too much. I, I think I think that that can hurt. I think going on a writing sabbatical is good with no computer. You know, um, again, bring your notebook. They're portable. They go anywhere. They never run out of power. Although your pen might run out of ink. Um, but you know, yeah, I, I do think that life experience is incredibly important. And when you look at the stories of how some great works were written, the stories behind those, um, whether it's a film or a novel or whatnot, uh, there's always more to the story. There's always more to the story of the primary uh, creative person involved. What about the type of life and the type of, of um, experiences this person has had? Because you know there could be some people that they maybe had more of a sheltered existence so they're only going to have a certain frame of reference for writing a story. Whereas I've known some people that they've gone to Europe, didn't tell their family, had just the clothes on their back and learned to survive there for a month somehow and came back unscathed. But that would that's a different life experience than your parents driving you to college and, and right. getting you set up in your dorm room. Well, I, 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 think, I think the reason that... Um, we live in such a bizarrely divided time where people are fighting over, in my opinion, some of the stupidest arguments I've ever heard. And I think part of it is that we need struggle and we need adversity. Because I believe that struggle, when it comes to us as a human self, is, and the way of overcoming a struggle is, uh, this is gonna sound strange, is puzzle solving. It's Overcoming that is in a, in a video game, it's leveling up, right? But I think part of the struggle is okay. Um, here, you know, you're, you're, you're not making ends meet with your bills. You're gonna keep having that problem until you do something different. You know, your relationship's not working out. Well, it's probably not the people that you're dating. It might be you and the choices that you're making. Solve that problem. And I, I feel like, we live at a time where people are kind of manufacturing problems to experience adversity that they're really not able to experience in their real lives, which explains to so much of the nonsense that you see online with people battling each of each other over things that are uh, pointless. Um, I try to not get involved in those kinds of discussions. I find them a waste of time. And, uh, you know, time is limited. I, I want to focus on the things that matter, right? And, and choose to use my time in a way that's wise where I end up with a result I can look back and go, okay, I sacrifice not arguing with people on Twitter six hours a day, but look what I was able to do. Or rather than writing thousand, 500 word, thousand word Facebook posts 
arguing how right I am about a thing, I wrote a thousand words a day and in two months I had enough for a book, enough material for a book, which is technically what you would have if you wrote a thousand words a day for two months, you'd have enough material for a book. So I think that as humans, you know, we, we seek out as a way to kind of level up or, or improve our situation. We need that because of, and this is why this is gonna sound like even more of a weird rabbit hole. You can go down and research this even is puzzles are so popular. Puzzles, gaming, video gaming, you know, uh, puzzle solving, checkers, chess. I mean, look at the history of gaming through humanity, right? There's a reason video games are more popular than movies. Video games make more money than movies. And the fun of a video game is solving a problem. And I think we need that. We need that. Our human, we need to puzzle solve, solve issues. We, we, need, we need adversity to fight against, to level up. I think it's, it's your self-awareness, uh, you know, plays a lot into, are you gonna keep going down that road and making that same mistake and spending all that time on social media arguing with people you've never met or maybe like divert that energy into something more useful? So that would be my advice there. But um, uh, go down the rabbit hole of puzzles through human history and you'll find that it's something that, um, th that humans have kind of always had around. And in addition, I would, I would research and look into how children learn. Do children learn through memorization? They can, yeah. Memorization is a great technique for kids to learn. More effective is turning things into games or puzzles. Kids love it and they gravitate towards it. What if we're not designed to be totally harmonious and what if groups need a scapegoat? because it makes them closer. So the group can bond if they have an enemy. Yeah, um, that's a scary thought that you just expressed. And I, and I, and I see that um, when it comes to our current climate. Um, I, I think that that's something as a human species that we need to overcome. I think we have to overcome the, the inclination to do that, to vilify someone as a way to feel superior as a way to uh, other them and vilify whatever it happens to be about. We must learn to resist that urge to do that um, and to have some empathy for someone who may not think the way that you do, who, who, who may live a life that you don't 100% approve of now, if that person isn't doing anything that hurts anybody else, I don't know why that that would bother you. For some people it does. And I think that, that we have not as a species reached that point yet. Um, I like to think that in the uh, Gene Roddenberry future that he envisioned for Star Trek in the original series and, and Next Generation, they talk about having overcome those types of things and um, a more elevated existence were certain types of things. Well, as a human race, we got over that, right? Well, we certainly haven't in our present day, and I hope that we learn to. Why do popular franchises fail? I feel that popular franchises tend to fail because corporations are incapable of making them under the current factory filmmaking conditions. One, popular franchises are created generally by a singular person who was not paid by a company to think it up. That it was an idea that came not necessarily fully formed, but percolated for years from that person's experiences, whether it's a Gene Roddenberry with Star Trek, whether it's a George Lucas with Star Wars, whether it's a J.R.R. Tolkien with the Lord of the Rings series, a franchise comes birthed from a person, not because a company hired them to think up a new franchise. It came out of someone because it was a creative thing that they needed to express. And big companies, which are required to fully fund a huge property or franchise, uh, the conditions under which 
content is made at those corporations is not conducive to a singular creative voice. It's art by committee. There are other concerns. Budget is a concern. Is it going to have a happy meal? I mean, um, Tim Burton famously uh, got in trouble after the uh, sequel to his 1989 Batman film starring Michael Keaton. The second movie, Batman Returns, was much darker in tone and more to Tim Burton's creative liking. And it infuriated McDonald's because here was a movie that was kind of frightening to young children. Uh, they even, McDonald's even issued an apology. There are videos on YouTube you can look up about this. Uh, McDonald's actually issued an apology when they released a series of Penguin, Catwoman, and Batman toys because the movie didn't really fit the young demographic that would have bought, say, a Happy Meal. Uh, so you've got your, your, your budget concerns, your are we going to be able to make toys, are we going to be able to, you know, put the cast in that we want? Like, in addition to concerns about, well, uh, this movie costs a lot. Is it going to play in other countries? Is it going to play to a worldwide audience? Because we're spending $400 million on this thing. Once you have all of these concerns on the shoulders of a creator, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to come out the other end with something that still has that vibrancy of a single creative vision. Now, some filmmakers have learned to work within that system very well. I would say that uh, Christopher Nolan is one of the filmmakers that has uh, had more success than failure in, in that working within that system. Although there've been, uh, you know, I don't know if there was a Happy Meal necessarily for the Dark Knight Batman movie. I don't remember actually, I should know that. Um, but his other films as well, and in addition, someone like Denis Villeneuve with uh, Dune, he was able to balance the studio concerns and have a vision that was his vision of the novel, uh, Frank Herbert's original novel for Dune. So it can be done, but I do think that it requires a singular creative visionary that has the full support of the studio. And when they say, look, um, when Chris Nolan says we're not gonna do Inception toys, maybe listen to Chris Nolan that like, hey, this movie, I don't think the toys are necessarily gonna work with this, right? So, but when I think once you have, you know, signed over the rights to whatever it is, Star Trek, a Star Wars, a Lord of the Rings, and handed it over to a group of people who never created it to begin with. Then what you've got is, you've got that new creative team now saying, I'm gonna do my version of this. When it's something that maybe George Lucas would never have allowed to have happen. Or a Gene Roddenberry would have said that doesn't fit the universe. Or Tolkien would have said, no, this is not what would have happened in this universe. They're not there to be the checks and balances. So when you've lost that primary creative voice and it just becomes a piece of IP, you know, when it's looked on as intellectual property and then you've even got in that mix the concerns of stockholders now for the company, like, well, you know, we're just gonna do this because it will appease the stockholders. You have so many concerns, it's a miracle that almost anything worth watching comes out of a studio these days. Uh, so, I think that's where they go wrong is you've lost the original person who is the shepherd for the franchise, whether they're actually do, directly doing the writing or not, right? So you've, when you've lost that shepherd and it goes to a corporation, I don't think a corporation is the best fit for the most positive result. It can happen and it does happen. There are glimpses. But for the most part, I think the era that era is gone. I don't think we'll ever see like a George Lucas or a Gene Roddenberry or, or um, someone like that ever again. The hoops that you have to jump through, the concerns that you have to balance, stockholders, toys, budget, this, you know, it's, it's amazing. I think that's a skill unto itself. Now I would love to hear 
And I've had very frank and honest discussions with friends of mine in the indie film world who all say, you know, it's almost like a lot of these movies, the story behind the scenes of making the movie turns out better, that's a more interesting story than the movie because the fact that, okay, we got the financing, but the girlfriend of the main investor who's putting in $10 million, she needs to be the lead and she's not that great. And so you're juggling, I can even, I can almost tell when I see a small indie mover, I'm like, oh, these are the compromises that person had to make because these are the weakest parts of the movie and the filmmakers just fingers crossed, hoping you don't notice. So um, it's almost as if, uh, I, I think a lot of filmmakers would benefit from, you know, taking some courses in therapy, in diplomacy, and in finance, in addition to being decent at making films, in order to be able to set those concerns aside and, and make something creatively fulfilling and worthwhile with that singular vision. But I see franchises you know, going off the rails and I'm like, it's just too many cooks. It's, it's corporate content, too many cooks, made by you know, committee, and, and you, you can just see it. You know, this recent um, teaser for The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power just came out and there's a 56 second trailer for it. And I'm looking at it and to me, it looks like a PowerPoint presentation that was shown to Amazon to sell the series. I don't know what connection it has to Lord of the Rings. To me, it looks like dollar store Game of Thrones. I It doesn't have the feeling of the Lord of the Rings. It's a miracle that Peter Jackson was able to make Lord of the Rings with, um, with his own creative vision, but being incredibly respectful of the source material. And that's a thing that I think is not spoken about enough, the respect for the source material. And I know that Peter Jackson, he's even spoken about this. You can look up interviews with Peter Jackson. He said, you know, I have my own personal ideas, but these aren't my ideas. This is Tolkien's story. I'm gonna tell his story. And this will be, you know, his own vision of that. And I think that, uh, I actually think that part of the reason that Peter Jackson's original three Lord of the Rings trilogy turned out so well was because he made it in New Zealand, far away from the distractions of, th that could have consumed him from, you know, the, the corporate overlords in, in, in Hollywood. So. So being off making those movies uh, away from that distraction in, in New Zealand, I think actually helped quite a bit. We have this quote here. We actually have two quotes. I don't know if you want to turn around. I know we sure. said you, you weren't allowed to look at it at okay. first and now <laughs> we have the big reveal. And uh, I'm assuming you probably know these quotes. Maybe you don't, but I don't know if you want to read them for our audience. I would like to, yes. Okay, great. We made a promise to ourselves at the beginning of the process that we weren't going to put any of our own politics, our own messages, or our own themes into these movies. In a way, we were trying to make these films for him, the author, not for ourselves. Well, that's Peter Jackson, and he's talking about J.R.R. Tolkien. And this was his idea when they began to work on the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And Arguably, the Lord of the Rings trilogy of movies is the most successful, one of the most successful trilogies in all of movie history. And I say this for a couple reasons. One, we don't talk about it very often. And I, I mean that in a good way, meaning we're not trying to wrestle with its failure. We're not saying, well, the third movie didn't land. Uh, you could say that for Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, you could say that, you could even say that for the original trilogy. For some, the, the Return of the Jedi did not completely work. Um, so many trilogies or film franchises, you know, this is, I think, where the term stick the landing came from. And, you know, Peter Jackson was able to do that. And I think it was because he stuck with this philosophy from the beginning. He trusted in the story, he trusted in the source material, 
He had the utmost respect for it. And yes, he made changes to make it, to make it translatable to the screen in a way that would appeal to people who are not fans of the source material of the original books, of which I am one. I've never read the books, not to say that I wouldn't be a fan if I would read them, but um, Sword and Sandal, uh, Wizardry, that kind of, it's not my personal favorite thing. I'm, I'm more of a science fiction buff when it comes to genre material that I like. So the fact that I'm a fan of the Lord of the Rings films because of how successfully it was pulled off, I think that's saying something. And I think it comes from the, it really comes from that first trailer. The first trailer for the first Lord of the Rings film, when you go back and watch the preceding trailers, really got you engaged in Frodo's story and gave you a glimpse into what this journey would be like and what the stakes were. And also uh, the music, music's amazing. But if you watch that, the original trailers for the original, the very first Lord of the Rings film, The Fellowship of the Ring, um, it's, I mean, it gives me chills just even thinking about it. Conversely, with um, the Amazon series, which is being made for money, which you could argue all movies are, you know, all movies are made for money, but I think when, when also it's coming from a, a, a need to creatively express something, I think that that's much more powerful. And, and when you compare the original trailer for the first Lord of the Rings movie with this current upcoming Lord of the Rings series, The Rings of Power, it just seems like no comparison. To me, that trailer looks like dollar store Game of Thrones. It looks fairly generic. You know, there are other criticisms about the, you know, the look of it not being, you know, faithful to the source material. I can't speak to that because I've never read those books. I just love a great story. I, it, it's not present. Yes, it's a teaser trailer, so let's cut it some slack. I am hoping that even though this quote is from Peter Jackson, that the makers of the new Lord of the Rings series would keep some philosophy like that in mind. In fact, that's actually a very good guide for any person who is embarking on the journey of making a franchise project for which they did not create that franchise. That's a good, that's a good mission statement. We have a second quote. No, let's read the second yes, quote. Yes, let's, let, let's, okay. Uh, it felt only natural to us that an adaptation of the author's work would reflect what the world actually looks like. Uh, I believe, I don't know who said that, but I believe that is from the makers of the new Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. And my concern about that is that it's, they're already giving themselves an out to stray from the original source material. Uh, Tolkien made a world that looked like, well, the world he created. I don't understand why you would stray from that. I, I can get, you know, what their corporate reasons are, but I think more, a more compelling reason would be the creative reasons for that. It, it, it to me, that statement, that, that quote is an excuse to, to turn it into something that I mean, what are they gonna do? The concerns of, what are they gonna do? They're gonna put hip hop music in there because hip hop is very popular. Is that what they're gonna be doing? At the, at the, at the, you know, it's whenever they do that, I mean, I've noticed it in previous franchise. Well, this is, especially in particular music is the thing. Like, well, this is the popular music now. So let's have somebody sing a rap song in a Star Trek movie. Okay, those things always, they never work. And what it does is it dates it. And what I, what I, what I think that work, tends to work better is sort of a timelessness to the storytelling. Yeah, so that, that second quote uh, is, is really troubling to me. It's, it's corporate speak for, we're gonna do whatever the hell we want and uh, damn your allegiance or love of this franchise because we're just gonna do what we think is right. 
And I, I don't agree with that. You know, speaking of Tolkien and, and like old books, I was watching a, um, a quick trailer on a woman who runs an old bookstore and, and about collectibles. Mm -hmm. And she said, basically, when we get these old books, we need to take very good care of them. And we need to know we're just kind of keeping them for future generations. Because when we pass on, someone else will be getting this book. And we're sort of like keepers of the book. Do you feel like... In some sense, it's the same thing with the storytelling. Like we're, we're really just here for future generations, making sure that it's preserved. Well, I love that sentiment and I hope it holds. But I think we're living at a time now where uh, everything creative is being undone and remade. And not with the interests of preserving the original author's intention. Whatever era that person came from. So... I love that because I am someone who still goes to used bookstores. So I, I, I love that sentiment. I have concerns that, that the same respect is not being paid by the corporations that purchase these franchises for the purposes of updating them and, you know, adding things that that just don't work, that just they just stand out and they just, like, it's like, oh, they're doing an update. Well, that's over. I mean, you see it in desperation. There are certain sort of tropes of things that would happen. I mean, they call it in television, they call it jumping the shark, right? In the Happy Days television show, when they did like this two-parter where Fonzie is, it's something you would never see. Fonzie's, uh, he's water skiing and you see a shark and he literally jumps over this, this incline over the shark. He jumps the shark. This is now happening in, in movies, right? It happens a lot in, you always knew a franchise was over when they would bring in a cute character. In older television shows, they bring in some cute younger character because some of the child actors had already aged up. It's the Cousin Oliver syndrome. Look that up, Brady Bunch. It's a reference. I'm dating myself, but like, and, and they even made a joke about it in The Simpsons. Um, with Itchy and Scratchy, they brought in a character called Poochie, which was a skateboard riding, you know, backwards baseball cap uh, animal character that rapped. And Poochie was meant to appeal to the kids. And that is a very simplified version of exactly what we're discussing right now. It's when you're updating it to a modern audience, um, you're, you're, you, you run the risk of, you know, one, creatively, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. And secondly, you are going to alienate the audience that has lived with these stories for decades and probably read it when they were younger and have visions in their mind that are better than a movie that you could ever make. So ah, that, that quote is very troubling to me. The latter one. Yes, the, that last quote is very troubling to me. Without checking your phone, can you name all of the Christmas films you can think of? Oh, wow. Well, I, there's a lot. There's so many that I love. It's a Wonderful Life, A Christmas Story, Bad Santa. <laughs> uh, God, they're, I mean, the, I don't know if you consider The Grinch is Still Christmas. It's not a Christmas movie per se. Uh, but I always associate that with Christmas along with the Peanuts Christmas special. I mean, oh God, there's a bunch. Th those are just like off the top of my head, my personal favorites, the ones that I make sure to watch every year. Uh, and then there's ones that uh, people would argue aren't necessarily Christmas movies like Die Hard, but I would put that in that category just because I love the whole, uh, I think it's become an ugly Christmas sweater that says, Ho, 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 now I have a gun. I've seen people wear that costume. So you would consider Die Hard a Christmas movie? For me, it is. For me, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Yeah. What needs to happen in a Christmas film? Does Christmas need to be saved? Uh, yeah, it's... I, I wonder if you could even make an earnest Christmas movie now that isn't relegated to the Hallmark Channel. And by that, I mean a wide-release Christmas movie that, that goes to theaters that would appeal to people who don't care about Christmas. It's just a heartwarming movie that takes place over the holidays. I mean, I think that the thing that needs to, to happen in any Christmas movie, one, it's gotta take place during Christmas, 
which Batman Returns by Tim Burton does. It takes place during Christmas. Um, it, it also, somehow the message of Christmas has to be in there, woven in some way, a realization, a love of fellow your fellow man. And, and I think that has to be a big part of it and lessons have to be learned, right? I think that's part of Christmas is this, for me, there's a feeling that exists around Christmas that is palpable. And it usually starts around, you know, Christmas Eve night that you could just feel and Christmas is the next day. And it's sort of a, um, it, it's, it's sort of a reconfirmation of your relationships of people close to you in your family or your significant other uh, and, and a way to reach out to family and friends and, you know, say, hey, I care about you. So that has to be a big, a big part of it, even if it's woven in in the most simple way. Yes, I know that It's a Wonderful Life is, it's dated. But I feel like what's sad to me is that certain people would think that the message of It's a Wonderful Life is dated. That is where I have concerns because I feel that, and in particular, this comes with acts of heroism, whether it is in an actual superhero movie or acts of self-sacrifice or acts of uh, kindness towards a fellow human for no reason whatsoever, whatsoever other than to do that. And I feel like that as a value has been lost. And I notice it in modern films and television, I feel like that kindness towards your fellow person, human, American, you know, neighbor, it's, it's not as present as it used to be, unfortunately. Um, although I will say if you spent some time on social media and you get up and walk outside your house and normally that, that feeling isn't present, but, but Christmas is, is uh, first of all, I love those Christmas movies, you know, but the Peanuts Christmas special would never be made today, in specifically because of the quotes from the Bible. And there was even controversy, controversy at the time about like, is this gonna be a religious special? And it was, and now it's, it's something that has survived till today, but I think it'd be incredibly difficult outside of a small release, religious, uh, you know, show, uh, film showing at churches and whatnot, or something for the Hallmark, Hallmark Channel, you wouldn't see those kinds of religious ideals, even if it was simply the ideas without the Bible verses. Um, I don't think you would see that. And it's, you know, it's again, it's another fracturing of our audience, right? Like. There's a huge audience that would love to see a movie about Christmas, even if it's only peripherally about Christmas, right? But yeah, yeah, I, I think it is, is uh, those values, those rituals are, they're eroding and they're not as popular on a mass scale as they used to be. I, I, I'm just saying what I have observed, but try to get a Christmas special with religious themes that doesn't, on a mainstream level, it'll never happen. Not, something made by a major corporation is not gonna do it. It's gonna be relocated to a, you know, what they call a vertical, which is a small audience. So there you are. When would you typically play a Christmas movie? Well, uh, Christmas is my second favorite holiday. I'm What's gonna your be, first? I'm gonna be honest with you. My first, my favorite holiday is Halloween. The decorations go up in late September. It's a month long uh, celebration. It's horror movies for the entire month. And so I love Halloween. Uh, you know, Christmas, I sort of like, once, I've, once I'm into the turkey around Thanksgiving, uh, then the, the Christmas movies go into rotation. You know, and, and then it's like the, the ones that like, um, which actually still has some heartfelt messages, Bad Santa, you would not think this, and you will never look at a pickle the same way. But Bad Santa kinda 
uh, is also one of my one of my Christmas holiday favorites. If you were to write a Christmas film, would you be the protagonist? Would you see yourself in the protagonist? Well, if I wrote a Christmas movie, I would I would not be the protagonist of that movie. Uh, I would, <laughs> but I'd like to see if Hollywood could make a, you know, a, a new, a new Christmas movie. You know, to me, one of my all time favorites is A Christmas Story. Now, could you make that movie today? Could you make a movie where a kid, little Ralphie, just wants a gun for Christmas? You know, today's climate, it's a little different. You know, uh, I, I, I would love to see, and I've heard rumors that Peter Billingsley is going to do an update of A Christmas Story. I'd love to see a sequel to that movie with his character all grown up. You know, maybe he wants a different type of gun for Christmas. Who knows? Uh, but, you know, <laughs> that movie is not just about Christmas. It's also a, ref a reflection of this, uh, of that, this bygone era. Um, and I, I just wonder if Hollywood is capable of making a movie about Christmas. I feel... And this is not so much a reflection of the industry. I think audiences would want it. I think that there's so much cynicism in the entertainment world. And Christmas is about loving your fellow, loving your neighbor, and, and unity, that I wonder if Hollywood is even capable of making that type of film. I really wonder that. So look, do I wanna see the sequel to A Christmas Story starring Peter Billingsley? as a grown up version of himself, maybe it's set in the 60s, I would love to see that. Uh, is that gonna happen? I don't know. I is it gonna happen to a satisfying degree? We'll see. Maybe he wants a glue gun. Maybe he's a crafter. I, yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> but you know, not I own everybody- I several glue guns myself. Oh good, okay, so, yeah. so someone who makes props and sets and things. Who knows? But not everybody celebrates Christmas. That's true. So, That's true. so it does alienate many people. Who right. have different, you know, whatever, and in whatever it might be, just be non-religious. Maybe True. they don't believe in consumerism and things like that. There could be a whole right. anti-corporate angle to it. Yeah, um, I mean, Black Friday. Yeah, I mean, there have been yeah there there have been movies that have explored the over commercialization of Christmas. That's fine. I think that's part of it. I think that's a valid critique of the holiday. And having said that. I love the decorations. I love the excuse to get together with friends and family. I love the idea of we're gonna take stock and inventory of the last year and commit to being, say, a better person in the new year. Maybe there have been lessons learned. And it's that, that holiday period where we can kind of take a step back and assess, you know, what have, we, what have we accomplished? What are we capable of doing? How can we do better? And, and how can we contribute to a better world? I think that, that that idea, that message defies the holiday. Forget the holiday, forget the commercialization. That idea of self-reflection, that I think is just important for anybody. You know, No matter whether you like, celebrate the holiday or like it or hate it, doesn't matter. That idea is something I think that we need to do on an annual basis. When you think about villains, what are the characters who come to mind? Well, I would say the greatest villain in movie history is Darth Vader. That, that would be a, a great villain that comes to mind. Uh, Hans Gruber in Die Hard, I think is, is also an incredible villain. But the, I mean, here's what's interesting. The villains tend to always be more interesting than the, the protagonist and the hero. Why? I, I, I think the reason that villains are much more interesting and much more popular than the heroes is, and I'm sorry to say this, I think they're relatable because they speak to a darker version of ourselves that exists in all of us that we resist. And the villain is caught up in a, you know, in at least not necessarily the villain, but but as an audience member, 
we're caught up in the like, oh, well, you know, I'd never do that, but I guess Darth Vader would do this thing that I would never do, right? And it's it's always a, a battle internally over morality. And I think what makes villains interesting, especially really well-crafted villains, is that they don't think what they're doing is wrong. From their perspective, from the villain's point of view, they're right. I mean, there's a reason that, you know, there is the term Thanos was right, right? Like Thanos' mission was to set the galaxy right and wipe out half of all life in the galaxy so that other life could thrive. Uh, there's a lot of logic that doesn't work, quite work in the Marvel Avengers series, you know, that, that Thanos ended up being the, the main villain of, but people kind of look at that and say, well, he has a point, you know? He has a point about, you know, wasting resources of, you know, so that's where that term Thanos was right came from. And he is, you know, at least in the movie Infinity War, he's such a big part of that film. It really is his journey through parts of the Marvel universe right, experiencing all of these heroes that, you know, we've come to see through their own individual movies. And in uh, Infinity War, you're, you're on Thanos' journey. He's the lead character of Infinity War. He's the one that is influencing all of the events. Um, and what's interesting is when you look at the screen time for villains, this is, what, this is what's amazing is you can see a movie that has a great movie villain like a Star Wars, whether it's you know, the original series or Anakin Skywalker in, in the prequels. And what's interesting is how much impact a great movie villain will have with so little screen time. Very little screen time. But the villain influences all of the other characters in the movie because the protagonist is constantly having to react to some something that the main villain is responsible for, always. They're the one that's like, even though they may not be present on screen, the villain, the main villain in a story is always the, the person that is influencing events. So, and Darth Vader to me is the culmination of probably some of the best aspects of, of villains from all types, uh, you know, whether it be from you know, movie serials or comic books. Uh, it's fairly easy to argue that Dar Darth Vader was very influenced by Doctor Doom from the Fantastic Four comic books created by Stan Lee. Uh, the look of Darth Vader kind of based on that, also based on a little bit of a samurai in there um, in terms of the helmet and, and other aspects of Darth Vader's character and the fact that it took, you know, uh, you know David Prowse as an actor, uh, and then James Earl Jones as a voice actor to kind of create this and also the physical look, you know, the costume designers and, and whatnot and, and Ralph Bakshi to kind of design the character or versions of the character to what it became on screen. So, so much went into the creation of Darth Vader as a villain and that Darth Vader has a tragic backstory that only a piece of it becomes revealed in the second movie in which Darth Vader appeared, The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, you know, villains have layers. Heroes are pretty much like, I wanna do the good thing, I'm gonna resist doing the bad thing. Okay, uh, villains, there's much more tragedy, pain, trauma, and I think that th that actually makes them more relatable. Not in the sense that we would wanna act out uh, and or emulate any of the things that a, a, a villain on screen would do. In particular, say, villains from Quentin Tarantino movies, right? They were the you know, main antagonists of those, of those, of Quentin Tarantino's films. But like, it's a way to kind of like exercise your own demons, right? Like, and, and that's why I think that movie villains are so popular. And that's why I think that I don't even think I need to look at a poll. I'm I'm certain that if you looked up best movie villains, 
Darth Vader is going to be in the number one, if not in the top three position. And, and I think that they'll always be a source of fascination. I think, I think that of late though, it's gotten to the point now where there's a deconstruction of villains. Okay, it's like, well, what led to this person becoming the villain, right? With movies like Cruella or even the Star Wars prequels, right? Like what led to this person? They started out as good, but then they became bad. Well, what is that journey like? And that's become a whole other genre unto itself, right? The deconstruction of a movie villain and showing it from their point of view. And I guess from Darth Vader's point of view, you know, he wanted to set the galaxy right. And, you know, uh, so from Darth Vader's point of view, from Anakin Skywalker's point of view, he was doing the right thing. I don't know. I, and I, I think that, you know, from Thanos' point of view, the same thing. From other great movie villains' point of views, you know, they had a mission they were trying to fulfill. I just think that um, villains always tend to be the most interesting characters. Are villains always the most unlikable or is unlikability and villain two separate characters? Yeah, I I, I, I don't know. I, un, unlikability is, I, I, I don't know. It's like an um, unlikable in, in the sense of, you know, I mean, you're gonna like the villain, otherwise the hero has no journey, right? Uh, and And, yeah, I think unlikable is, you know, maybe a term be better used for like a side character or, or whatnot. Or an unlikable character um, might be better way to describe Han Solo in the first Star Wars movie, where he was kind of, uh, he was selfish. He was out for himself. He only cared about money, didn't care about the cause that, the, that uh, Princess Leia was on. And he was... You know, parts of him were unlikable. He was still, it's, look, it's Harrison Ford. He's a very attractive man. That chiseled jaw. Sure. I'm very envious of that ch right. chiseled jaw. Be right? mean like, to me. Yeah. Exactly. He beats me. <laughs> so, but he's, you know, um, he's unlikable and has a redemption, right? So that redemption arc is important. Not just, you know, and, and we've seen it happen more with villains. Uh, I don't think necessarily Thanos had a redemption arc. Um, you know, but the story of Darth Vader is a redemption arc, which is a very Christian story. What about female villains? Yeah. Because uh, if, if you, oh, sorry to interrupt, but Walter yeah, no. White's wife in Breaking Bad, was she really a villain or was she just unlikable? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would probably say unlikable, but from her point of view, I feel like the audience can relate to the, you know, the moral dilemma that she's faced with, which influences her decision making. So I, I don't know that I would consider her necessarily a villain, but, but, you know, unlikable in the sense that Walter White is, you know, he's he's our guy. He's the it's right. You the stories, understand stories yeah. about him, mm -hmm. and but I but I feel some empathy for her from the standpoint of well she's making the decisions for what she thinks is best. So while I, while I would understand with some understand and empathize with her decision making, wouldn't necessarily agree with it. Was there a villain in Amelie? I mean, look, I think I, I think I think the villain in Amelie was Amelie's agoraphobia, really, and her um, ability to relate to other people. That was the thing that she needed to overcome. Here she is kind of in love with the world, but this shy, quiet girl who, you know, um, has, uh, you know, she, she gains this, you know, delight over connecting people with, with some aspect of them that, that reawakens some love, right? Which begins with that little box of toys and the, the, and, and, and her journey, the, the sort of, you know, like she's, she's doing good in that sense. But then, you know, the person, she's thinking about all these other people and how she can kind of help them along the way. And she's, she thinks about herself last, right? Uh, but, but then that journey becomes about her, you know, overcoming her own agoraphobia. I don't know if that could be considered a villain in the movie, but it's certainly the challenge that the protagonist must overcome. And I would say a mild case of agoraphobia. Uh, in her case. Sure. It's not like panic. No, really no, no. But, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, she she repelled from 
connecting with a with someone who could be a lover for her. She repelled from it and she walked away fearful from it. She resisted it. And and then it comes full force. That's such a great movie. Amelie is such a such a movie that is in a category all its own that defies you, you know a, a, you know it's such a simple story and yet a complex one all at once and it's not a story that is told well very often so having seen it in the theater when it first came out and I mean that movie is is just incredible who are some of the smartest villains you can think of well i don't know that i would classify them as smart i i actually like when there's a decent bond villain but the fact that they keep getting tripped up by bond means they're not very good villains you know it's i mean it's almost it's almost laughable or comical um, that so many movie villains i feel like these movie villains should watch movies with other villains because then they'd see kind of like the roots of their mistakes which is one um, the main cause of death of a movie villain is falling from a high place so don't be anywhere high like if you're going to construct a throne room in a half constructed death star try not to put it somewhere where there's a chasm where you could fall to your death i'm referencing of course uh, the return of the jedi and and the emperor and his untimely demise or did he die i don't know it was never really explained uh, in any case so yeah I, I i don't know i think the smartest villains are always kind of several steps ahead of the protagonist and i mean to me the uh the trio of villains in the original raiders of the lost ark i think are i think were great because at the end you know indiana jones did not win he simply kept his eyes closed when they when they opened the ark so he was immune to the dark spirits that were released from the ark but belloc and his you know the 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 his his cohorts were all taken out by their carelessness their you know their their lust for power right of getting the ark I, I i feel i feel that what a lot of people forget about you know raiders of the lost ark is that you know indian jones doesn't win he he fails he fails in the end the villains win and then they become a victim of their of you know their own hubris they're you know they're taken out by the the deceased spirits it was never really explained we had this question come in on our youtube channel from kp is the name what can creatives do to help make the film industry better and more free for artistic creation how can we get back to making great movies again <sighs> kp first of all that is a great question how can we get back to making movies that are great and by great you, I'm going to guess that you mean just a broad appeal and a satisfying experience, an experience where you walk out of the theater and, you know, wow! Not only did you enjoy that experience, you want to, you want to go back and see the movie several times. I have not had that feeling. Very often, I want to go back and see a movie again because I want to, you know, just ride that ride. It feels it's almost like a ride, an exhilaration, you know so how do we get back to that i think what we have to do is uh, really foster and mentor talent young talent not simply fill a writer's room and there's seven different writers for a project and re really really mentor new and up-and-coming talent and foster that one um, number two and i know that hollywood is is averse to this but almost everything you see that's on a large scale in terms of a big budget is based on pre-existing material a comic book that's been around a comic book property that's been around for 80 years you know uh, a stage play that is you know been on broadway for decades or a remake 
of a cartoon and now this is the live action version and whatnot. So seeking out something original, something original that, that it may have some source material but hasn't been made five, six, seven, eight times. I know that's a risk. I know that's a risk. But I, I think it's important to seek it out. You know, San Diego Comic Con used to be, which is something, it's, it's an event that I've attended for longer than I care to remember, but th that used to be a place that development executives from Hollywood would go down to San Diego from Los Angeles and they would seek out like a small comic book that no one's ever heard of that has. A, an amazing hook, an amazing story. It was a place to look for new material. And I feel like that has to come back. And in addition, I think it's a more informed development community. So that would be my, my third thing is a development community that really reads, that isn't just aware of, you know, like, oh yeah, 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 I know Star Trek, you know, but, you know, has seen all the episodes of every Star Trek series ever made, right? In, in, including the, you know, unaired pilot, right? Like just has, has seen it all. So I think a just more informed base of people working in Hollywood that, that while they're burdened with the concerns of like, well, how is this gonna fit marketing, stockholders, this, just be aware of the you know, other creative possibilities that are out there, including original intellectual property. I even hate using that word, IP and intellectual property, but you know, there are very few creatives in Hollywood now that are even given the power to be able to exercise that. Christopher Nolan is, is one of the people that's, that's been able to do that, but there are far few. So, and then I think part of it is also developing talent. So, attending your major film festivals and looking for movies made by small up and coming filmmakers. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it in the room where I've seen like, you know, a movie made for $10,000 shot with just like, you know, almost not, you know, just like there these are the resources we had, but you see the creativity through the adversity. You know, there's not a lot of money, there's not but you see like, oh, there's a vision there. There's a vision, there's a visionary that's behind that. So I think it's really seeking that out. You know, it's it's not much different than, you know, someone going out and uh, seeking talent for a football team, you know, or a professional, you know, a professional sports team, right? You got to seek out talent. And that means you've got to look at people as they're coming up through the ranks, which is going to be your film festivals. And everyone who's been in a position that is now successful whether it's a James Gunn or whether it's a Christopher Nolan or whether it's a Taika Waititi, all of them started in indie film. They all started with small movies. Taika Waititi had a movie that was at Sundance. Uh, Christopher Nolan had a movie at both Slamdance and then the following year, Sundance with Memento. His first movie following was at Slamdance. James Gunn started with exploitation movies. He worked for Lloyd Kaufman at Troma Pictures. So these creatives, you know, really were able to cut their teeth when kind of it didn't matter. You know, the stakes were low. You know, the budgets were low, the stakes were low. They could make mistakes, it's fine, it's okay. And then we're able to kind of like, okay, get bigger and big, bigger budgets and prove themselves. Certainly, you know, all of those filmmakers, Taika Waititi, James Gunn, Christopher Nolan, all of them, you know, started with smaller projects and built along the way and were able to make mistakes at a time when it necessarily didn't matter. But also they had that, they were able to develop that creative vision, you know, especially in particular, if you look at the movie that James Gunn made before he was hired by Marvel to do Guardians of the Galaxy, he did a movie called Super, starring Rain Wilson. And it's a superhero movie about a guy who's kind of fed up with the world and just decides he's gonna be a, you know, superhero and he's gonna fight crime. It's also a comedy. I mean, it's very much, 
It's no different tone-wise with a lot of James Gunn's later work, but you see it, the seeds of it in Super, really where it kind of all came together. And, and from that, he was able to then do a big budget Marvel superhero movie where he was given pretty much creative reign. He put together, and James has talked about this in other interviews, you could look it up. He put together like what they call a, a presentation. Some would call it a lookbook. It's this is what he wanted the world to be. So he, he really laid out like this is the tone of Guardians of the Galaxy. This is the universe. It's the cosmic Marvel universe, which is different than other types of Marvel movies. It was, you know, the, the first to kind of delve in that arena. And, you know, when, when you track the careers of those creatives who did much smaller work and move up the scale, I think that needs to be developed more. Even if it's a matter of you find a filmmaker at a, you know, from a film festival or a filmmaker that put out a movie on a small label like a Gravitas Ventures or Wild Eye Releasing or October Coast, these are the small indie, you know, indie film distributors uh, that, or there's a company called Indie Rights, these small, look at these movies and you can see, you know, there are filmmakers, there are gems. There are diamonds in the rough that have put out films at all of those companies that are ready to maybe go to, maybe not necessarily a hundred million dollars, but the next level up and then see what's possible. And I feel like that type of talent needs to be, needs, needs to be fostered, mentored, grown, you know? Would Memento be successful if it came out today, if we'd never heard of Christopher Nolan? I actually think I actually think if Memento came out today, it would be successful. It's such an original story. It's so it's it's you know one of those things where it it's a movie. Memento is on a short list of movies that I say require a second viewing to completely grasp all of it. Then you notice it. It's like oh, it's stories converging, right? Like it's 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 such a fascinating you know you know twist on a traditional narrative, right? With familiar aspects, things we, you know, we've seen before. It's like, okay, it's kind of a noir, a mystery, right? But there's more to it. So yeah, I actually think that that would be successful, but I don't wanna talk about this too much because some studio executive is watching this right now saying we need to remake Memento. Someone is doing, right now there's a studio executive. I see you, I see you studio executive, whoever you are. Remake Memento? Yeah, sure, why not? All right, fine. Go ahead. But give the opportunity to a young up-and-coming filmmaker if you're gonna do that. Instead of post-its, he'll use notes. Who knows? Yeah, so notes on the phone, right? You could you could update it, but in a way that's a way that's clever and interesting, not that compromises the story. I yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole other thing. How can indie filmmakers compete with Hollywood? The way that indie filmmakers can compete with Hollywood is on the level of ideas. Because there are ideas that Hollywood is gutless to explore. You will never be able to compete with Hollywood necessarily on a budget standpoint, marketing money. Having said that, there are so many more things at your disposal as an indie filmmaker that you didn't realize. Whether it comes to talent, and asking someone who would bring money to a project, who knows who that actor might be, who is like, you know, you know, maybe sitting around works three months of the year and the rest of the time is playing Dungeons and Dragons. Not a joke. There's a whole group of Hollywood actors that play Dungeons and Dragons. Might not be a bad thing to learn. But there are more things at your disposal than, than you would realize. So I would say focus on casting, um, focus on making the film because there's really no excuse for an indie filmmaker because equipment is so inexpensive. I mean, you know, I almost look good with the cameras being used right now. But, and these cameras are not particularly expensive to rent and or purchase. So on that level, make sure that you have that covered. But the way indie film competes with Hollywood is with ideas. And then what happens is those ideas will be ripped off by Hollywood because that's how that cycle works. Now that's fine if they hire the person 
to do that. I mean, Sam Raimi, arguably, if you look at the Evil Dead series, the original Evil Dead film, Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn, and the Evil Dead 3, that, that um, he's basically remaking the same movie over and over again with a bigger budget. I don't have a problem with that because it's Sam Raimi doing it. Let him do it, that's great. And, and those movies hold up, they're really fun, the Evil Dead films with Bruce Campbell, which have amazing commentary tracks, if you can track them down. Very useful films from, from Sam Raimi's early career. But where I think indie film competes is ideas. So here's what you do. Don't do what Hollywood is doing because you can't do that on a budget scale. What you can do is explore ideas that Hollywood would not have the guts to do, that Hollywood is constrained by checklists that they must always have in a big Hollywood movie. Indie filmmakers are not burdened by that checklist. And you have to be fearless when it comes to how you may be perceived on social media, right? Fearless. Stop caring what other people think. Move full force with your creative vision. And that's not something that if you look work for a major studio and you make a movie with budget and concerns, that I think comes with burden. I mean, I've, you've heard the stories time and again of, of the, the burdens that come with, or the, the creative shackles that come with making a movie for a major studio. You have complete creative freedom and you need to exercise it. If you're not exercising it, why are you making it indie? Just, just pitch it to Hollywood and let them give you the money and, and move on. But if you're gonna make a small indie movie, you, you better be willing to explore some ideas because it's underestimated and underused the audience's imagination. I'll give you an example, a throwaway line from Star Wars. I know Star Wars comes up. Okay. Um, uh, Grand Moff Tarkin walks in the room, Darth Vader walks in the room, they, they, and they, they're having a council meeting, right, on the Death Star, and he talks about the Emperor has wiped away the Imperial Senate. There'll not be a concern for us. I'm not quoting it correct directly, but that's the basic line. Well, one, I'm an audience member. One, who are all these evil men in this room, right? This is already scary. Secondly, wait, there's an Emperor of the Galaxy and there's an Imperial Senate. Who is this emperor of the galaxy? There was an imperial senate, why were they wiped away? And the, the thing is, is that Hollywood has become so used to the fact that they can just do anything. Uh, why don't we just show that, right? So we can show this. Well, ultimately, when we finally saw the imperial senate in the prequels, it was a little maybe underwhelming. Like, oh, okay, that's what it looks like. It looks like a lamps plus, uh, or, you know, that's weird configuration of, it looks like a giant chandelier upside down. Okay, weird. Um, in any case, but what I'm saying is, is that my imagination as a kid was utilized because characters in the movie talked about off-screen events happening. And I think that that is a device that is underused. So as a filmmaker, I would say to you, use the audience's imagination. You don't necessarily have to show everything. There are different ways for information to get be gotten across, and not just through some news report, right? That's the that's the lazy go-to is a news report on the news. You know, they call it the device they call it Captain Narrative, where it's like somebody that just sort of explains the narrative to kind of catch the audience up with what events are happening. So my suggestion is try to use parts of the audience's brain that they're not used to using, which is their imagination. I think that not only will you'll engage the audience more, get them to, you know, whether they physically do it or metaphorically kind of, or, or they just sort of lean into the story. They're just sort of leaning in and, and, and gets them to think about what the events they're seeing. Like, oh, like this, and also I think it shows respect for the audience, right? It doesn't mean you're not gonna have your money shots in the film, whether it be something big budget or whatnot, but you know you can expand your world by allowing the audience to use their imagination 
and convey information in a shorthand, whether it be dialogue, something that's seen very quickly. Um, I, 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 I see that less often in major studio movies and I'd like to see it used more often in independent films. You know, explore an idea that's never been discussed or explored or explored in a way that is new and fresh. That's what I think is the power for an independent filmmaker. You, you need to really make sure that those ideas are so compelling that if you just tell someone the idea, they'll lose their minds. It almost sounds like you're referring again to the topic of puzzles. Right, yeah. Because, you know, maybe showing a crime that, you, it, we don't see the crime that was committed, but we hear about it from different people's points of view. That's, that could be one aspect of making the audience guess. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it gives the audience something to do because, I mean, look, what's the number one thing you want to do in a movie? You want, how, how do you want the audience to feel? You want the audience to feel that they care about what's going to happen next and what's going to happen next. Right, and you're leading them along, and you're giving them crumbs, but not all of it, right? And give them some work to do. And I feel like the, the reason that the original Star Wars films hold up, the original trilogy, is because it gave the audience something to do. There's so much of what's seen in the original Star Wars trilogy that's never explained, you know? That, that are such clever throwaway ideas that are in the background that just spur the imagination. And that's hardly done these days. I mean, if anything, audiences are spoon-fed and over-explained. Things are over-explained to them because studios think that audiences are stupid, and that's not the case. Audiences are much more savvy these days. They're way far ahead, which is why so much content is like, meh, it was okay. I can't tell you how many times I've walked out of a big Hollywood movie and forgotten it by the time I walked to my car. Like a big action movie where you're like, well, none of that really mattered. What were the stakes? I didn't, it seems like I've seen it before. I feel like indie film has the freedom to go a few layers deeper and explore new ideas and engage the audience with it. So please more of that.